Let's well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to RIT and the Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences. I am Jeremy Hafner. I'm Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at RIT, and it is absolutely terrific to see such a jammed auditorium here for what bodes to be a very informative, very interesting panel discussion today. On behalf of President Dessler and the RIT community, I would like to express our deep gratitude to New York State uh, Majority Leader Joe Morelli and Monroe County Legislator Justin Wilcox for bringing their cybersecurity panel series to RIT. And as you'll hear in just a moment, it is very appropriate that RIT hosts this series. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors today, including the Office of Development and Alumni Relations at RIT, the Office of Career Services and Cooperative Education at RIT, and uh, of course, the Department of Computing Security in the Golisano College. I am especially grateful, as your Chief Academic Officer, to thank the faculty and staff for these areas and their support uh, in today's program. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, it's really fitting that Majority Leader Morelli and uh, County Legislator Wilcox would bring this cybersecurity panel here uh, to RIT. Uh, the seriousness of cybersecurity uh, is evident. It's clear. Uh, you can't pick up a paper these days and read about some attack that has occurred, whether it's a corporation like Target or Home Depot, or the Sony Corporation, or certainly you hear about the military activities that uh, are being sponsored by various nations and get concerned about our safety, our well-being, but at the same time, our privacy and our private information. But fortunately, uh, RIT offers a counter-strike strategy against those intent on malicious cyber activity, because we are a national leader in educating the next generation of cyber professionals, and thankfully, others have noticed. RIT has been designated a National Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance and Cybersecurity Education by the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. RIT cyber defense team group of students recently won the Northeast Regional Competition of the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition and was awarded third place in the national competition uh, two weeks ago. Two years ago, we took home first place, and Dean Sears assures me that next year we're going to get that trophy back again. Right? Right. But the strength of our computing security student skills upon graduation are really unmatched. It might surprise you to know that RIT is among only a few universities with a degree major called computing security. And I'll let you know that we are the first university to have an entire department, an academic department, devoted to computing security. But wait, wait, there's more. The freshman class, the incoming freshman class of students into our cybersecurity program has gone from 41 in 2013 to 71 in 2014, to 110 projected next fall. That's an increase of 175% of freshmen. Applications have grown 220%, and the graduate growth in our graduate program has gone up 35%. So you can see that RIT has a momentum behind this really important program, and I thank the Golisano College for their leadership on that. RIT really is a counterforce uh, of good, if you will. So the time is now to raise the awareness about the need for a skilled workforce in the area of cybersecurity. Everyone in this room is already aware that there are more cybersecurity jobs in the marketplace than there are qualified people to fill them. But what does it really mean to choose a career in cybersecurity? What skills do you need? What is the lifestyle of a cyber professional? Those are the kinds of questions we know high school students and even middle school students are asking as they explore career cybersecurity. And I think we'll get to some of those answers uh, to these important questions in today's panel discussions. 
We are recording today's presentation and we'll make this discussion available for dissemination to schools and libraries throughout New York State and online because RIT is committed to spreading the message about why considering a career in cybersecurity is a wise choice today and will be for many, many years to come. And now I'd like to turn our attention to introducing Majority Leader Joe Morelli. Joe is a graduate of Eastridge High School and received his bachelor's degree in political science from SUNY Geneseo. He's an inductee of Eastridge High School Hall of Fame and the State University of New York Alumni Honor Roll. Since his election to New York State Assembly in 1990, Joe has authored more than 200 laws and established himself as a leader on the issues that matter most to the people of upstate New York. And Joe, last time I checked, that essentially would qualify you as a tenured full professor here at RIT, <laughs> so I think we should work on that. In January 2013, Joe Morelli was honored to be appointed majority leader of the State Assembly. And as majority leader, Joe is responsible for the day-to-day -day operational duties of the Assembly Chamber, including running the floor during debates. In addition, Joe is a member of the Rules Committee. And prior to the becoming a majority leader, Joe served as the chair of the Assembly's standing committees on insurance, tourism, small business, and ethics. And he's held many positions on the Ways and Means, the Economic Development, and Higher Education Committees. Joe's the former president and CEO of MNI Technologies, which specialized in data management software development. And I now realize that this is a good reason why Joe's so interested in this topic. But in his role, he developed a true passion for learning about ways emerging technologies could improve efficiencies within government operations and communications. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome to our friend, Majority Leader, Joe Morelli. Joe, thanks for being here. Good afternoon. Someone uh, suggested we might get 10 or 15 people to show up at a meeting on uh, cybersecurity. So, I uh, am delighted to see the turnout, and uh, I want to thank some people. One of the things you do when you're the majority leader is you, you never forget that it takes a lot of people to put on a successful event. First of all, I'd like to thank the panelists. This is an extraordinary group, and uh, such a great collection of uh, thoughtful people around this subject, uh, and I think it's just uh, a, you know, a testament to their uh, dedication to this that they're all here today. So I want to thank them for participating. I want to thank the RIT family. I spent, although I, as... Uh, Jeremy mentioned, uh, I'm a graduate of uh, SUNY Geneseo, but I spent a lot of time at RIT. I think at some point through osmosis, uh, Mr. Provost, that I should get some kind of honorary something for the amount of time I do here. And we partner an awful lot uh, with RIT on a whole host of initiatives over the years, and um, uh, largely because this is an extraordinary organization. Uh, it really is, uh, from Bill Dessler, who's the president and a dear friend. I see my friend Jim Waters, the uh, chief financial officer, um, and our Chief Information Officer, Jean Caceres, and Meredith Smith, uh, who works with my friend Debbie Stendardi doing uh, uh, government affairs and communications. So the whole RIT family uh, is an extraordinary group and uh, one of the great economic drivers, not only of the Rochester region, but all of upstate New York. So I want to uh, thank them and, of course, the provost for her, his great uh, leadership uh, of this extraordinary uh, place. So it's, it's really a, a delight to be here. The only place I would rather be is maybe sitting on the bay with a cheeseburger. But other than that, this is the only other place I'd like to be. And I, I do want to talk a little bit, and just for a moment or two, um, about what's happened over the last decade and the digital revolution. Things that I literally could not have imagined happen now routinely every day. And um, Jeremy mentioned I was for a time the, uh, the uh, president and CEO of a small software development company. Really uh, in, the, in the 90s and just a little bit uh, as we crossed over to the 21st century, and how much the world has changed since that time. It's, it's almost unbelievable to, uh, to uh, appreciate. We are more connected, we are more empowered than we have ever been before, but we become more susceptible to the dangers that we're gonna talk about today. These threats have come with that, the need to develop new skill sets uh, within IT that allow us to combat cyber attacks and protect critical technology infrastructure. The World Economic Forum maintains cybersecurity as one of the top five global risks 
and it has been ranked as the top concern in a uh, survey done by the federal government of chief information officers. In addition, the White House has issued executive orders on improving critical cybersecurity infrastructure. Make way the cybersecurity professional. Currently, professionals in this uh, arena are among the most sought after employees in the tech sector, and the demand is far outpacing uh, other IT jobs. Uh, and the demand for cyber know-how is only likely to grow. I do think that um, I sometimes wish, although you live in a complicated world, you young people, but uh, I wish I was 40 years younger uh, and a whole lot smarter. This is the career that I would have chosen to go into. The, I think this is incredibly exciting and incredibly important. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, jobs and network systems and information security professionals are expected to grow by 53% in just the next three years. It's an extraordinary number. By all accounts, cybersecurity is a growing and potentially secure and lucrative industry if you're an employee. Uh, a Semper Secure survey found that workers in cybersecurity are generally commanding $116,000 a year in salary, which uh, compared to a lot of other uh, professionals uh, is, uh, is not at all a, um, a bad uh, uh, amount of money to be earning. And so I'm very pleased to partner with RIT, and I want to thank them again for their extraordinary efforts in hosting today's panel. We had a panel earlier this year as it related to consumers and the need for them to be aware of uh, best practices when guarding personal information, talked about identity theft. We had the Attorney General staff in and a number of other organizations dedicating to protecting individuals. This we thought was particularly important because of the partnership with RIT and, and all the work you do to talk about this as a, a place to attract young people uh, who are skilled and thoughtful about how to make sure that we continue to be secure both in government and in the, uh, in the private sector. And um, so it is, is indeed a, a real delight to be here. RIT, as was mentioned by uh, the provost, was one of the first universities in the nation to launch a dedicated department for computing security. And the uh, National Security um, NSA and, the Homeland, and Homeland Security have recognized uh, this institution's efforts in this area, naming RIT as a national center of academic excellence in information assurance and cyber uh, defense education. Um, the cyber defense team, which I understand is in the orange shirts, it's a lot of orange on this campus, uh, as was mentioned, have placed first, second, and third in the last three years in national competition. So that's an extraordinary uh, achievement, and uh, I commend all of you for the great work that you're doing. I think we have a, uh, even a citation to uh, present to the team uh, in just a little while for their outstanding efforts and to continue to put RIT on the map in this area. So as RIT prepares a new generation of talented professionals, we have the skills necessary to protect our public and private sectors from evolving uh, cyber threats. I think today is indeed a very, very appropriate panel, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here as a part of it, and hope many of you will, will take the information and use it to, uh, to guide your career decisions. Uh, I would like now to introduce my partner in this. He's actually a longtime friend. He's a member of the Monroe County Legislature, Justin Wilcox. And I must admit, because you have to give credit where credit is due, I, about six months ago, or so, Justin called me. We've worked together on many projects. And he said, you know, we should be talking more publicly about cybersecurity, threats, opportunities, uh, what people ought to be doing. So it's really his ideas. I'm just the pretty face that, you know, uses my name to organize things. But Justin's the real brains of the operation, and, and he's really who inspired me to get involved in this and to uh, head this series and these panel discussions. So uh, without further ado, let me bring up my good friend, Monroe County Legislator Justin Wilcox. Thank you for that kind introduction, Joe. Um, I also want to thank President Dessler, uh, Provost Jeremy Hafner, Debbie Sindardi, uh, Meredith Smith, Andrew Sears, Bo Wan, uh, the sponsors, as well as this great group of panelists. Um, as Joe so eloquently mentioned, uh, RIT has been great, and they've been a uh, a wonderful um, partner in this effort. Um, I'd also like to thank Majority Leader Morelli uh, and his staff. We're extremely lucky to have Joe in Albany. He's someone that not only tackles the tough issues of today, but has the ability to look over the horizon and see which salient issues are emerging and which need to be addressed sooner rather than later. I think good leaders do that. They get ahead of the curve. They anticipate. I'm, I'm not just scoring points here. I, I, I think this is also um, relative to RIT. It relates to RIT. RIT is home to that same kind of leadership. 
they were one of the first institutions in the country to offer a degree in computer security. So Joe and I both have experience in IT. Joe told you a little bit about his. Uh, we probably were both engaged in IT around the same time. Um, Joe started and ran an IT business, and I worked in the area of cybersecurity for a large IT services company. So when Joe and I first decided to put this series together last year, we approached it not just from a public policy point of view, but also from a personal and professional perspective. With our backgrounds, we knew the one institution that needed to be included in this series was RIT. In recognition of this, of the prominent, uh, prominence of the program here at I RIT, Andrew Sears, the Dean of RIT's Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences, attended the White House Summit on Cybersecurity and Consumer Protection this past February. And as has been mentioned, uh, Joe mentioned this briefly, that RIT formed a cybersecurity team in 2008. It's never finished worse than fourth at nationals. In fact, RIT came in first, second, and third in the past three years. So it's entirely appropriate that we're having this discussion about careers in cybersecurity here at RIT. The cybersecurity field is a fast-growing field, and according to a number of surveys, some of which Joe mentioned in studies, there is, there is a definite shortage of cybersecurity professionals. According to a recent report from Burning Glass Technologies, the demand for cybersecurity professionals has grown more than three and a half times faster than the demand for other IT jobs over the past five years, and more than 12 times faster than the demand for all other non-IT jobs. Current staffing shortages are estimated to be between 20,000 and 40,000 and are expected to continue for years to come. So as Joe mentioned, um, the salaries for some of these jobs can be as much as $116,000 a year. Actually, that's an average. So while salaries can certainly be a draw, it's worth noting that cybersecurity is also a matter of national security. So it's a field with an important public purpose. So in summary, we hope that the young members of our audience will learn a bit about what it's like to work in the area of cybersecurity, what skills are useful, and if you want to pursue a career in the field, it's nice to know that we have RIT, one of the leading programs in the country, right here in Monroe County. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's panel, someone who probably no, needs no introduction here at RIT, um, but Gene has achieved uh, many recognitions in the area of information technology. In fact, uh, she was recently, in 2013, Digital Rochester's Technology Woman of the Year. Jean also spent 15 years uh, at Paychex in the um, senior leadership position. And uh, as I mentioned, um, she has been the CIO here at, for the past six years. So Jean, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to RIT and Career Opportunities in Cybersecurity. Uh, I think we've uh, established a wonderful panel of experts and folks that are passionate in their career and are here to share some of that with you. So I'd like to start off by introducing our panel and asking them to introduce themselves, starting with Kirk. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Kirk Strebeck and currently a special agent and also the program director for the FBI Cyber Lab at Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute. And previous to that, I was a legal attache in Estonia where I led the cyber investigations for the FBI in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Ryan. I'm a fourth year computing security student here. Um, in my spare time, I work as a global threat intelligence consultant for Symantec Corporation. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Alex Gates from the National Security Agency. I'm a current tech director within the Information Assurance Directorate where we provide uh, protective services for government networks, classified networks uh, around the world. And I'm also the um, senior education and academic liaison, um, say that fast, um, to RIT. So I spend a lot of time here uh, working with uh, their um, CAE program um, and um, helping with uh, recruiting. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Sanders. I'm a security researcher from TrustWave uh, 
under the Spider Labs subsection of TrustWave, and we handle pretty much everything to do with commercial security and sometimes governmental security as well. Good afternoon, I'm Bruce Jones. I'm Vice President, Chief Information Security Officer from Lifetime Healthcare, the largest brand that you guys would recognize as Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm also on the advisory board for the security program here, so I work a lot with, with Bo and with Bill Stackpole and others. Hi, my name is Christy Faley, and I'm a fourth year secu uh, computing security major here at RIT. And I'm Eric Myers, the director of cybersecurity at Corning Incorporated. Uh, prior to that, I was with DuPont for 25 years in a variety of different roles. Spent about 15 years in the security space, and I'm an RIT alum. Graduated from here in 88, before most IT people could even spell security. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So I didn't bring my phone to the podium as I'm expecting an important phone call. I have my phone here because we are tweeting this event. As you can see, there's a hashtag at the bottom of the screen. And if you would like to uh, tweet in any questions, we'll add them to what we've already assembled for our panel. And our hashtag is RITCSEC panel. It's on the bottom of every screen. So I'll shut off the noise to my phone as it'll uh, continue to beep, I'm sure. Okay, so. You know, we've talked a little bit about already what is happening in this field. And every day, there's another piece of information of a business or an entity that's hacked or hit or breached or information's leaked. And it's becoming more and more apparent to us as a society, as a world, that information security is critical. Those data breaches cost us more than just the actual loss of that data, but a loss to integrity and the market ability of those businesses. So as these breaches hit and as these attacks happen, there's a greater need for information security professionals in the world today. And I really liked uh, these particular numbers here where it talks about there's 11% identification of needs for all occupations. That's 18% for IT professionals, but a large high 30s, 37% for information security. That means we are going to have a shortage of information security professionals in our world today. So as the breaches get more serious, our, our uh, resources and our pipeline of, our, of, of security professionals become smaller. So with our partners in New York State, we are looking here at RIT to strengthen that. We are looking to be part of that solution to help create that pipeline of security professionals for the future and for the world. So as we've had this conversation, we thought about a number of things that we thought people would be interested to know. So starting with our panel here, what do you do day to day as a cybersecurity professional? What brings you to work every day? What's exciting? What's not? Okay. So um, i really kind of describe both jobs I've had in the past uh, five or six years. So the recent one is I'm embedded at Software Engineering Institute, and what I do is I kind of provide a bridge between our FBI investigators um, in all the field offices domestically and internationally as well. And whenever they come up with problem sets in cyber investigations, both criminal and national security, we have a team inside the FBI that tries to solve it. Uh, we have a research engineering center as well. And sometimes when um, problems get a little bit too much for us to handle, either based on time or just expertise, we'll turn to Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. It's a federally funded research lab. And so what I do is I work with a cadre of software engineers, and we come up with software solutions to tackle some of the problems that criminal investigators have. And then in the job I had overseas, basically I led investigations for the FBI in those three countries in the Baltics, um, both for national criminal and national security investigations. Thank you. I'll make a couple of comments. So, um, you know, a lot of my job as a, as a chief information security officer is somewhat boring. I go to a lot of meetings. But I will say that in the security field, there is a constant stream of entertaining stories that you come across as you're investigating inappropriate use of computers and, and what have you. So it is entertaining to some degree. Um, one of the best things, though, is I get to spend a lot of money. My wife doesn't let me spend much money at home. I've got a multi-million dollar project that I'm spending money all the time at work in, in new technology. And so it's, it's fun. I mean, there's a lot of fun in that in looking at new technologies and looking at how you can better protect your organization and looking at some of the obsolete technology and replacing it with some of the, the latest and greatest technology. So the people that work for me, they love it because they're getting to get their hands on new technology. They're having a lot of fun. Most of my team has dual monitors and, and high-powered computers. Um, 
it, it's just, you know, it's fun being able to build that environment for our employees and also getting to, to um, play in it a little bit myself. I guess, I guess I'll take this. Uh, for my day to day, it's a little bit unusual uh, because a lot of my cohorts here are in a little bit of a different position than I am. I do security research, uh, so there are a lot of meetings more than you would particularly expect, and that's true with any field that you go into, be it uh, governmental consulting, commercial consulting, governmental work proper, or research development. Uh, that's, that's one of the main things you see. One of the main things that we all do in addition to that is we all read a lot of the news. I'm sure that they could all agree uh, that that's a big part of it. This field moves so quickly that you need to keep up on every little detail that happens, but you'll never get it all. And that's a really, really big part of how we learn and how we process information as, as an entire industry. In terms of actually doing work, it sometimes takes a, a little bit of a backseat to what you might think you do once you get out of school. Uh, you don't necessarily spend eight hours a day just slamming at code all day. Uh, it's, it's a lot of strategy meetings. It's a lot of uh, governmental meetings. It's a lot of figuring out how you're going to do things, how you're going to work with other people in order to do things as well. Uh, and it's a lot of helping out your other your coworkers, questions and answers. And this changes almost none of these change via industry. They all are uh, constant across the board, be it uh, commercial or governmental. Uh, so there's actually a lot of work to do, but it's a lot different than the work you might expect that you're doing. I'll just just have one other comment, and that's uh, you know you've heard everyone mention the increased number number of meetings that people are attending, but that really speaks to some of the evolution that's taken place in this field. And that security now has a seat at the table. People really value it as, an, as a key element of the business. And I think we can thank the, the awareness that we've had in the media of some of the breaches now. Because now we're asked to collaborate with other parts of the business and really demonstrate how we can help satisfy those business objectives. Yeah, so I'd just like to add um, a kind of a, a twist on the collaboration piece. Um, there are some of us who have been spending a lot of time thinking about where we should be in three years, in five years, and uh, what technology, what tradecraft, um, you know, what kind of data will we need uh, to solve, um, you know, this problem for, for the nation to be successful in protecting systems. And the collaboration with uh, industry, with academia, with national labs, you know, all kind of uh, trying to get everyone to row in the same direction to solve this, solve this problem. Uh, not so much for today, even though today is a big deal. But, um, you know, it's not going to get any easier. So some of us are investing in what's down the road. So. Excellent. What, what kind of advice would you give to current and future students in cybersecurity? And if you could also comment on the news outlets <coughs> or the places that you read or review in order to stay current. Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the things that's most useful uh, for students especially is developing yourself outside the classroom, uh, doing some extra work, taking projects, labs, homework assignments that you have in your classes and taking them maybe a step further to kind of ask questions a little bit beyond what you're asked to do. Um, work on soft skills, interpersonal skills. Uh, while I might spend a lot of time just me and my computer uh, typing away at things, uh, doing research, um, there are situations where I've had to go and present and talk about things with people and, and field questions uh, from people of all different backgrounds and, and levels of knowledge. So it's not just talking about people, your peers, who might be more familiar. You have to uh, be knowledgeable enough to explain technical things to individuals who may not work in your sector as much as you do. Um, and then really, like, like I said, staying current on things. You have to do a lot of reading. Um, you get lots of uh, newsletters that you might glance over, but there are other venues. Um, certain threads on uh, Reddit, for example, that are particularly helpful. There are more industry-specific news avenues uh, that uh, professionals look to, um, news reporters, people that are more embedded in the sector that have a lot of great things to say. So staying up to date on things is extremely important. Uh, you, you won't catch everything, but you really need to uh, have an understanding of what the landscape is around you. I would add to that, you know, get involved. Uh, you know, we've got the cyber crew here. I mean, they're involved, but everybody needs to get involved in whatever way that they feel that they can. There's so many opportunities out there. You know, I'll name just a few. Impagard, you know, it's free to join. Yeah, you have to go through a short background check, but it's free to join, and we have events every month on that, a lot of opportunities to network with other peers in the organization. ISSA has a very active chapter in this area. Um, 
you know, get involved in your, in your local, your school clubs, um, you know, whatever you can do to get involved in networking, because when you're looking for a career, that network is gonna just be a tremendous benefit to you. Maybe not working directly at one of those companies, but getting you introduced to somebody else that might be able to hire you. So building that network is extremely important. And you learn a lot from those people and you can continue to tap on them in the future. But staying up to date, um, I've got Twitter feeds, I've got Google News feeds, I've got, um, I read Krebs, um, I get about a half a dozen magazines at home that I read on a regular basis, do a lot of online reading. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. You mentioned it a lot. I mean, it's so important to stay up on the technology and not just security technology, but technology in general and what's coming out in the, in the future and thinking about well, how are we going to protect that? You know, the internet of things, you know, how are we going to protect all of that? You know, the, the compute power in your cars and, you know, the medical devices that you're seeing now, you know, how do we protect that and do some of that own what if on by yourself to think about how you might protect that and what technology is needed. I think uh, one of the most interesting things that we haven't gone over quite yet, but I'm sure will be echoed a bunch of times, is that you really must actually love what you're doing to be here. Uh, everything that you've learned in school or that you're learning or that you will learn uh, will eventually become pretty much obsolete. And that's why we're echoing so hard that you should be keeping up on these news stories. You should really look to the community. You should really look to other source, uh, sources of information to solidify your knowledge. Uh, in addition to reading the news and the resources that you mentioned, there's also a local 2600, there's a OWASP here, there are DEF CON groups across the, uh, the world even. Uh, and those are great places to go. I implore everybody who's capable of going to conferences in our field. This is such a tiny field as we've gone over. There's not nearly enough people. Uh, but one of the benefits to that is the people who you think you look up to, who you would never meet, you meet all the time. You meet Bruce Schneier, you meet Charlie Miller, Dan Kaminsky, Brian Krebs, you meet Moxie Marlin Spike. So you meet all these people at these conferences and they seem like high, holier than thou uh, people when you're, talk, when you're looking at them. But in reality, they're, uh, they're just normal people just like you and they're really good to talk to, really great resources to learn from. What advice would you give Rochester and the state of New York to become a gravity of center for cybersecurity? I think uh, you know creating that center of gravity uh, for cybersecurity. You know, if we talk about trying to create an environment like you see in the Bay Area or DC, where you're continuously are drawing people in, you've got to create an environment that has lots of opportunities and jobs, and people want to be amongst people like themselves. And you know, I think with the program that RIT has in place here, you're creating fertile ground for that because some of you folks in this room are going to have some innovative idea. You're going to you're going to be an entrepreneur and found the next Symantec or McAfee or next security company. And you want to have a ready source of talent to be able to staff your company. So if, if we could find a way for uh, VC type funding or something to form some of these new companies right here in the Rochester area, that fertile ground of having this talent pool could turn, could turn Rochester into a center of gravity for cybersecurity. Yeah, I would say, you know, I'm um, I'm in Pittsburgh now, and you wouldn't think Pittsburgh is a cybersecurity hub, right? I mean, we do have Carnegie Mellon University, but they started the National Cyber Forensics Training Alliance, where banks from around the world actually have people in the seats sitting next to law enforcement, providing cooperation, um, sharing intelligence, um, and also because of the attraction for the cost of living and, and other factors like that. A lot of people look for Pittsburgh now for the kind of the banking, intelligence, cyber information. If you're a city like Rochester or the state, you can develop a niche as well. You can do healthcare, um, cybersecurity, and make that your niche as well. It's actually, it's kind of shocking uh, to realize this, but you guys have already done this. Rochester is by far an anomaly in the field of computer security. It's the 51st largest metropolitan area, and yet many of the most influential security people come from it and still live here. Uh, it turns out that uh, many of you might not even know anybody from uh, Arlington, Texas, which is the 50th largest, <laughs> let alone anything to do with cybersecurity. The fact that uh, of the 8,000 companies that have a billion dollars or more in uh, revenue, uh, most of them, one third, are in the 20 top cities in the world. Uh, so the fact that we've already 
used universities and we've used local chapters like the ones we've mentioned, uh, local conferences to booster and bolster this uh, particular uh, this particular field within this state and within this area is is already a major accomplishment, and I think we can keep keep going. And there's certainly different ways to do it. Some of the ways that we've mentioned, uh, but already we've been doing a great job at that. What should we be doing to attract more middle school students to this field? I, I'll talk a, just a couple of comments on this. Um, We've got a great program already, the STEM program, to try and attract students into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We need to continue to drive that, but we also need to integrate cybersecurity and information security into the STEM program. We need to move quicker than we're moving already. If you haven't researched the NICE program, it's a national initiative for um, cybersecurity education. We need to move quicker on that. We need to integrate that into the, to the STEM program. And, and we need to build local clubs, cyber clubs at these, these young, at these, um, I would even start at the pre-K through 12 and, and get students engaged in cybersecurity early on. Whether they be after school clubs to give them something fun to do to go learn about it, or whether it be clubs during the school day that they can do on their, on their, um, you know, their study times. But we need to get students into this. And, and, you know, I hate to say it, but we need to make this sexy. You know, you may, need to make it fun. The, the students really need to get engaged in this, say, this is something really cool and I want to get involved in it. But we can help with that. So I think that um, we're starting to do that. We're starting to make it cool. We're starting to make it fun. Um, security has turned into a more of a collaborative initiative. Uh, we see hackers talking to each other more often than security professionals are talking to each other. Um, and we're starting to change that. We're starting to work with other people in different in parts of the industry. And that's something that probably is making me stay in this industry more um, than when I first learned about this industry. Because I, when I first learned about this industry, I thought it was just a person sitting behind a computer watching logs and firing off certain rules when they came up. But now I see, after going on co-op, that I'm working with different people from different areas, and that's cool. Um, and with all of this insight and stuff, we need to tell this to all of our young, our young people that we love and say, this is a place of interest for you. We see that you have these qualities and we need to push them towards it. I, I would love to see some of you college students that are involved in this go into the middle schools and talk about why you got involved in it and how, how much fun it is and what you're learning from it. You know, I think for me to go in there, I don't relate as well to the younger students. I'm an old man, <laughs> face it. <laughs> you guys can relate with those younger students a lot better than I can. And so I think you could have a, a real powerful message that you could deliver if you, if you did some of that. Great. So we have a, a Twitter question here. What's a cybersecurity position that may not exist yet, but you anticipate? I'll take a stab at that. Uh, we, we see increasing emphasis on data analytics, identifying malicious behavior. So I think the, the, the emerging cybersecurity positions are going to be data scientists. And that's a field that will carry with it career opportunity even beyond the cybersecurity space because businesses are increasingly looking to mine that data for business opportunities as well. So that would be a, a good, good uh, opportunity in the cyber field today. Uh, you actually completely stole mine, so I'm going to have to go with my fallback. Uh, but another interesting area that we see progress being made in is, uh, that's typically under the engineering aspect, is radio frequency and non-wireless based devices, so non 802.11a, b, c, et cetera. I think we'll start to see a lot of effort put towards engineering uh, and engineering security because that's one of the typical areas that we've seen. Like we were talking about before, your car has a lot more power but your car is also becoming connected. How it's becoming connected is an area that's going to require a lot of focus and a lot of study uh, that's not necessarily included within the curriculum right now, uh, and it's also definitely not represented within the career field right now. Hmm. Yeah, I think you need to elevate um, a position like chief privacy officer in corporations to the higher level it is now. Um, and it's not just a legal position, it's someone who can blend their expertise in legal as well as the technological field, whether it's cybersecurity or just information technology overall. But I think that person needs, that position needs to be created almost in every company and it needs to be someone who can protect privacy as well as ensure data retention for its customers as well. 
Excellent, thank you. Does the government have a hard time competing with commercial industry in attracting cybersecurity talent to work? Why or why not? So I'll, I'll address that. Um, so there's a general perception that um, you know the government has a tough time, particularly the federal government, um, competing for for talent. And uh, in my experience, uh, it's it's just not the not the case. Matter of fact. Um, at NSA, uh, our retention rate last year was 95%. So when we get someone in the door, they stay, and, and largely because uh, it's just the mission. I mean, there, there certainly is a sense of, uh, you know, patriotic kind of approach to uh, national security, to uh, protecting information, um, maintaining, you know, privacy. However, uh, you know, we do some pretty cool stuff, right? And, and that's a big draw, and that's why it's easy uh, to keep. Uh, now, um, Admiral Rogers, uh, the director of NSA, has been talking um, a lot in the year he's been on board about um, kind of this need to partner with uh, industry, to partner with academia, um, and that there's kind of this um, need to share information, but also to share uh, experiences and talent. So. Uh, I'm not so sure it's a competition as much as it, as it used to be in other career fields uh, historically. Uh, we're all in this uh, together, and having a strong industry partner who can protect, uh, you know, uh, their systems and their care about uh, to partner with uh, what's required in the government is is just um, a reality that we deal with. So uh, it's not as hard. Uh, we're very successful, and and. When we bring someone in, they, they generally stay. To, to do a slight counterpoint to that, uh, because devil's advocate is so much more fun. Uh, so when, when government hires, they have more requirements. Uh, they have a particular mindset that they're looking for. And so when they get it, absolutely they stay. And those people are very productive, uh, hopefully, uh, rather. Uh, it is almost never a money issue. That's, that's true, but uh, sometimes people from other countries are not able to hold positions that are particularly interesting to them for obvious reasons. It's also an extremely, at times, regimented uh, lifestyle. And uh, the typical movie portrayed hacker might have an extreme problem with authority, but that does resonate sometimes with actual computer security experts. Uh, that kind of mentality doesn't fit within government. It doesn't really fit within commercial life either. Uh, but there certainly is a, uh, a more, let's call it, willingness to, to play because you're going to get who you can get. There's such a shortage. Uh, and so, well, it's definitely true. The numbers can't be disputed. Uh, they have more strict requirements for letting in particular individuals uh, for employment. And as a result of that, it is, it's going to be harder. It's going to be harder to, uh, to do it than it would be harder to hire someone in the industry where you didn't have those requirements, just how it is. Yeah, and definitely the barriers of entry are a lot harder, you know, and it's, um, but um, I think once people get in and, um, you know, we also do things like, um, we obviously can't always go out to universities and do research projects because we have, we have a requirement of U.S. citizenship and, and uh, security clearances, really hard to get, to have students go through the security clearance um, for the one-year project by the time they even get the clearance, they're done with that, that semester, right? So there's kind of a, they need to kind of have more of a streamlined approach. But that's why we use things like federally funded research centers, where you can have students move over for postgraduate work. And you can kind of cleanse the environment. So rather than go directly to CMU, we work within that research environment on campus. We know everyone's cleared um, at, at a particular level. We also know they're going to stay longer than a couple of semesters as well. But um, yeah, I would say for like, uh, I don't want to say low level, but people who are maintaining networks in the government, things like that, really hard to attract those type of folks to maintain networks to be on call centers. But for cybersecurity professionals, I don't think it's been that difficult. My job's totally different every day. We travel around the world. We really are privy to some amazing investigations in cybersecurity, uh, both in criminal and national security as well. Um, I think what we really have a shortage in that's not always mentioned is cybersecurity leadership. So although we're attracting a lot of workers coming in, it's almost zero-based leadership that doesn't have a clue what, what's going on. So we're creating um, broad-based education programs, not just for workers inside the government, but for the leaders too, because it doesn't really make sense for someone to be signing off on your work if they have no clue what you're doing is even correct. <laughs> it's 
So follow up to that, what key skills do you envision future leaders having from a leadership perspective? What's critical? Uh, well, as Kirk said, I mean, certainly leadership skills. Uh, you have to be able to work uh, with groups of individuals who uh, may be coming from different backgrounds. Uh, as Haim said, there might be individuals who are extremely knowledgeable, extremely resourceful, but they may not uh, like working with, I guess, authority figures is a safe way to put it. Uh, so kind of merging different teams together, I think, is a crucial skill. Interpersonal skills is important. Um, you have to be, of course, knowledgeable in your field. Uh, you have to have a, a good understanding of the fundamentals, what you're doing. And as I think we've discussed, it changes very frequently. You know, what you trained on, what you were educated on in school could be very different from what you see out in practice, um, you know, just a, just a few years later. Uh, so being able to keep current and... Um, I think we can all agree, you have to like it. You know, you have to love what you do. It, it's that passion that's going to uh, make you, you know, push you a little bit further. You'll read that extra article. You'll send a couple extra emails because you really do care about it and uh, you can really get behind the work that you're doing. Just to add to that, outside the government sector, one thing that's absolutely vital is having a sense of business savvy. You've got to be able to translate what you provide in security into business value for your employer. How is it your enabling the business strategy of the company, how do you translate that? Because we all love to play with cool tools and things like that, but unless you can make a business case for those things, they're very difficult to get. We just add one thing, I was gonna mention that as well, but the other thing is, at least in, in my level of role, you know, the saying in research is publish or perish, and to some degree in my role, it's extremely important that you've built a reputation for yourself as a leader in this industry. When I got hired at Excellus, I was amazed at how many people had gone out and Googled me and had brought up references of papers I'd published, presentations I'd given at national and international conferences. They knew more about me when I came in for the interviews. I was just amazed. But it's important because you're the leader, you're the representative for their company for cybersecurity. And they want to make sure they've got somebody that's nationally recognized as well as somebody that's nationally connected, that you have a network of people within law enforcement and the private sector that you can tap into. So in addition to that, just to add to what he said about translating, it's not just to, to business savviness and, uh, and arguing for your budget, but it's also translating to people who have no idea what you do at all. Uh, most of these people did not get a computer security degree or a computer science degree or anything to do with computers. Uh, believe it or not, they got there by working hard and getting their uh, own respective interests ahead of that. Uh, so, you need to be able to speak their language in addition to the language that we speak, which, uh, as many of you know, is completely different from that uh, particular language. Uh, and so that ability is one that, that is really hard fought for, I'm sure, many of the people here. Being able to take a technical term and translate it into a non-technical term or a non-technical explanation of what's going on is an invaluable uh, opportunity, an invaluable experience to be able to provide to a company. And just to quickly add, but at the end of the day, you also still have your core kind of components of, of leadership, right? Good communications, good decision making. Uh, those things are still essential, uh, you know, regardless of the field. And um, of course, having experience or background in the area is, is helpful, but uh, you'll be surprised how many uh, lack skills in, in one area. A great leader detached from uh, the mission, a great mission expert, but uh, you know they can't communicate uh, clearly. If you have both, then you'll be very successful in this area from a leadership perspective. So very true. So we have another Twitter question here. Is there a danger of too many obstacles being created gathering information as the security around that information increases? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a danger of too many obstacles being created, gathering information as the security around that information increases? Are we in danger of creating too many security locks, traps, uh, you know, firewalls? Does that become an obstacle in and of itself? Well, I guess, you know, if you look at it from the amount of data that we're collecting today internally, it's a big data issue. You know, we have to do SSL intercept and decrypt and, and being able to process that data. Um, it, depending on what country, now Excellus and Lifetime Healthcare is only a, a New York State company, so I'm lucky, but my previous job, I was a CISO at Kodak. You have to deal with all the international laws, and there's some very strict international laws 
to prohibit you collecting and processing certain information or, or certainly in some cases processing it outside of the, the country. But a bigger issue is the, the barriers that we have, and I know, um, you know, there, Obama and others have been working on trying to make this easier, but sharing of, of intelligence information across industries and across companies and being able to process that data and being able to quickly get out indicators of compromise and, and threats and risks that we can all deal with. And so having that national data sharing capability is imperative for us to be able to survive as an industry. I'll quickly add to that. There's this uh, technical trade-off between performance and security that exists al always. It's just how it is. Uh, so by adding additional firewalls, adding, adding additional IPSs, IDSs, WAS, everything in between, you incur a very, very heavy toll on your performance of your application. Now, that whole paradigm has shifted from people taking these out of line, removing the obstacles to get better performance, to recently we've seen them putting them back in place, taking the performance hit because they've realized that a security breach or a security incident where they lose data or they become compromised uh, is much more expensive to them than it would be not to have it in place. So do you take the extra couple seconds uh, to, uh, to uh, process your request versus not process uh, a secure request? It's always the paradigm. And uh, as the internet gets faster, we're gonna see things, I know we, we said big data and lots of buzzwords, uh, which is true, but we're gonna see things getting faster and faster and more and more information needing to process. Just in the last five years, uh, rather since 2008, uh, the internet speeds globally have increased 300%, which means that there's less time on the back end to go through all of those obstacles that we really wanted to do, uh, that we really want to do for security. And how are we going to deal with that particular architectural problem is something that I guess uh, is up to you guys. Yeah, our users demand instantaneous response time, and they have no tolerance for latency in their, in their um, requests, whether it be a web request or, or whether it be... Um, you know, anything else, so an EDI type transaction or something like that. So we definitely need to work on the engineering of the network and the systems and, and the performance of that and getting the throughput through that. Um, but I am seeing a lot of support for continuing to put in place the security programs and recognizing that it will cause some latency and, and it's just becoming a matter of business. I mean, we're, people are accepting that. How do you think the NIST cybersecurity framework is going to impact the industry? Witchness cybersecurity framework. Well, that's Tidian Sour. I don't know. <laughs> that's the question from Twitter. So How do you it's, think if NIST it's the, the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, the one that's been recently published, um, that's kind of a collection of, of frameworks. Um, you know, if you see wide adoption of that, I think it's going to improve the security across the nation. Um, you know, I see on a frequent basis a lack of uh, adoption of frameworks and a lack of some of just the basics that you would expect to see. Um, and so, you know, as a whole, as a nation, our industry, you know, the, the corporations and companies need to get much better at protecting their assets. You know, simple things like rapid patching, you know, elimination of operating systems and applications that are no longer supported and getting security feeds you know, basic firewall rules, um, geo-blocking, and, you know, a variety of things. And, you know, there's, you know, if you look at, like, the SANS Top 20, you know, there's there's just so many things that people are not doing today that, um, so hopefully if the NIST cybersecurity framework gets adopted widely, it'll improve the security of our nation. And, and I, I think with the level of coverage it's been getting, it's going to emerge as a de facto standard across industry companies are going to want to at least measure themselves to it just to shield themselves from some level of liability to show a reasonable and customary level of care that they're providing. The risk is that it turns into a checklist type exercise and doesn't provide any real benefit if people aren't really digging deep into the questions, understand the questions in the, in the other frameworks from which the NIST framework is derived. Yeah, I'm going to heavily echo that. Is uh, The checklist-based approach is something that you should really strive not to do. Uh, you should take NIST and really understand it for what it is. It's guidance. Um, you, you should take likelihood and impact and all the ratings that they give you in different areas of your company and different vulnerability types and whatnot and really think about what they actually mean in terms of vulnerabilities, in terms of security, 
uh, and apply that how your com how, what make, how it makes sense for your company. It doesn't necessarily make sense to think about applications alone. It makes sense to think about them as an entire corporate entity uh, and how they interact with one another. And that's actually where we see a lot of the issues with, uh, with these breaches is that they haven't done a proper risk assessment, understanding how particular entities like point of sale systems interact with their security landscape rather relying on those to be secure in and of themselves, which is, uh, which is really not a great idea. If you could pick one threat to address tomorrow and you knew you would be successful at addressing that threat, what would it be? Well, yeah, I, I would say insider threat, which is probably 80% of your leaks anyways. And um, I hate to use the term insider ignorance, but it's kind of like both threats, right? You know, you have your insider threats um, with employees and it's not necessarily their fault, you know, but I think there's really not a, a serious push for more education, more training in companies. And I think we pay lip service to it, but you know, you look at the vulnerability charts, if you can just hit that main uh, vulnerability of um, your own employee threats, if we could take away uh, mice from everyone's table, you probably would clear up 80% of it. But yeah, I think, uh, I think for me it would be insider threat. To me, if I could eliminate phishing and malicious email and get rid of it forever and it would go away, that would make me sleep a lot better at night. Yeah, I was, I was going to say insider threat too, but my second choice would be threats to our critical infrastructure. And you look at the dependency we have on, on some of the utilities that we have today. Look, look at what happened a few years ago after Superstorm Sandy hit, and we did without basic services in areas of New York, New York and New Jersey for several days, we were on the verge of civil unrest starting to break out. So just imagine if we have a broad-based attack that takes down our grid for a prolonged period of time, what would it look like? That would be a, a threat to our, our well-being. And so that would, that's the thing that keeps me awake most at night. I think, I think I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say education. Uh, because if you could solve education, that is education for developers, education for the end users, it, it's the end goal, right? Build security in is a model that almost every security practitioner follows. Uh, and if I, it, this is not really going out to the cybersecurity students. This is going out to the web developers, the mobile app developers. These are the people who are making the mistakes that make our lives more difficult uh, and make our jobs necessary. And thank you for that. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but if we could solve that, it would be a better world. And uh, I wouldn't have to stay up at night thinking about critical infrastructure issues either, which would, uh, which would be very much appreciated. Excellent. That's great. So in our, as our last question here, looking back, what do you wish you had known about a career in cybersecurity when you first started down this path that you now know today? I'll start. I wish I knew the career was going to exist when I started. So <laughs> I would have gotten into it a lot earlier on. Um, you know, I would say the other side of that is I wish I had had more education around systems engineering and architectures when I was going to school because I've had to learn that after the fact. I, I can't emphasize enough from a security perspective the need to have deep understanding of systems architectures and system integration, application development. It's, it's a field that you have to have very broad knowledge around the IT technology stack as a whole. And, and, and I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's anything that I wish I had known before I got into this field, because it's not really a field that I, I guess, consciously chose. You know, I mentioned in my opening remarks that when I graduated from here, I had a degree in comp sci, and people weren't concerned about security then. And my career kind of evolved, and I sort of followed my passion. I think some of the other panelists mentioned earlier that having a passion for the work that you do is a critical success factor here. And that's really what led me into this field, too. You know, as I got involved in, in dealing with security issues early on, I recognized the value of what it provided. You know, these were people's jobs that were going to be at stake if people were going to be able to. Uh, attack the companies that we work for. And so it, that really motivated me and gave me the passion to, to carry on with this career. Yeah, I, I would tweak the question slightly and, and say, um, you know, kind of wish what more people knew uh, more broadly. Um, you know, are we five, maybe 10 years behind the curve uh, when it comes to the threat and, and the risk and the problem? And where would we be as a nation if this 
program, for example, at RIT was started five, ten years ago. Um, you know, we have a, a, you know, a sort of a limited pipeline that we need to expand, and as a country, right, uh, how long is it going to take us to, to catch up? So it's, it's not personal. Sure, I would have liked to start a business of a few years ago. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, speaking from a national security perspective, it would have been nice for the light to come on five, seven, ten years ago than, than it is now. I kind of wish I would have known how many different options there are within the field. Um, I was kind of late to getting into it. I was actually admitted RIT as a computer science student. Um, and I kind of realized that after I got here, um, I looked down from the third floor onto the second floor and I said, those, those guys are doing some pretty cool things. Uh, I want to do that. Um, but I wish I knew what I want to do within the field. I, for the longest time, tried to do everything, you know, take classes in this, take classes in that, and really get the full scope of what's going on which is important, but you need to specialize in something. Uh, we're at the point where you, you need to do malware, you need to do forensics, uh, network security, something more specific. So I wish I had known that earlier. So uh, explore everything, but at a certain point you need to know that you need to hone in on something more specifically to become a, a stronger subject matter expert in that. To, to mirror a point that was just made uh, about learning everything, there's a part of future studies called accelerating change, and this is actually going to speak to your point as well. Uh, it pretty much states that innovation grows exponentially, so the, the strides that we're making in security and in technology as a whole are equivalent to years and years and years of research at a 1946 level. Uh, you can think about it like that. Uh, this, is, this is increasingly important when we talk about starting something even five years earlier, three years earlier, one year earlier. We could be a whole a decade ahead of where we are, we just started one year earlier, and that's an important thing to note. Uh, one of the other important things to note, and I'm going to go back to the question of uh, what do I wish I had known when they started this. I wish I had known that this is really not like Hackers the movie. Uh, <laughs> it would be like super cool if it was, uh, and it would be awesome. Uh, and even doing red teaming engagements, which I, which I have done a lot of, it's, it's not like that at all. You're really focused on getting to know people really telling them what the problems are, expressing where, the, where their problems exist and how to fix them. Uh, and the one thing I wish I had really thought about, though, was how much networking is involved. There are very, very, very few positions where you sit in a back room and you do reverse engineering all day. Those positions don't exist, really, for the most part. Instead, even in research positions and in managerial positions, of course, you need to explain things to people who don't understand technology. Um, and that might not sound as sexy as Hackers the movie, or as sneakers or whatever, um, but it's a pivotal part of our industry. And so if you're gonna really work towards anything, it would be understanding and uh, really, fun, let's say, uh, polishing your communication skills with others. Something that I just wanted to add real quick was um, something that I learned throughout my journey here at RIT was the security mindset. Um, we're now seeing that this new generation is growing up completely wired in, completely connected to everything um, all of the time. They have phones in elementary school. That's not something that happened when I was little. Um, so one thing that I wish that was taught in schools, in elementary schools, in middle schools, in high schools, was the security mindset, was that you control what is put out onto the interweb. You control how people view things. Um, and that's not something that has reached the younger generation yet. Um, so hopefully that will get tied into, at least New York State, <laughs> um, education standards. And, and to try things and break things. It's an important <laughs> part of our mindset is, is make sure you can break it. And if you can't break it, then you're not doing your job right. <laughs> Some of the best people are the, of our mindset are kids. Mm -hmm. right? You put a kid in front of a Windows machine, that thing is broken. <laughs> <laughs> so just consider that, Microsoft, as you go forward. I, say, I see a lot of cheering in the audience on that, uh, on that point. Well, thank you. I think that was a terrific um, uh, response from all of our esteemed panelists. Please join me in thanking you. And I want to thank everyone here for coming. Thank you for joining us on the journey as we prepare the next future leadership in cybersecurity here in New York State and Monroe County and here at RIT. So many thanks to everyone. Please join us in the atrium. There will be a reception as we uh, congratulate our cyber defense team for their win, and you'll have a chance to mingle and meet with the panelists. Thank you, everyone, for coming.